Hello, welcome to Talking Logistics, where we have conversations with thought leaders and newsmakers in the supply chain logistics industry. It's my great pleasure to welcome today's program, Jackson Wood, who's Director, Industry Strategy, Global Trade Intelligence at Descartes. And today we're going to talk about the growing demand for supply chain compliance and transparency. Now, there are many parts to supply chain management, and, and each comes with you know, unique challenges and, and requirements. But there is one part in particular that has always been important, but it's even more so today in light of, you know, what's happening in the world uh, today and in terms of new regulations that are in place or, or forthcoming, and that is supply chain compliance and transparency. What is it? Uh, you know, why is it getting more important and who's looking for that transparency and, and how can technology help? Well, those are the main questions we're going to discuss in today's episode, and it's great to have Jackson on the program to share his insights and advice on this topic. So Jackson, welcome to the program. Thanks very much, Adrian. Great to be here. So, Jackson, uh, you know, we've had many folks from uh, Descartes uh, on Talking Logistics over the years. Uh, you're a first time guest, however. So, uh, like I always like to do before kind of diving into the, the topic, uh, I'm always curious how people get involved in this industry that we're in. So, um, why don't you briefly tell us a little bit about your career path, how and why you get involved with supply chain logistics, and, and what's your current role and responsibilities there at Descartes? Sure. So I actually, um, like a lot of people who I've encountered with, you know, over 20 years working in the supply chain logistics trade compliance space, I, I sort of came to it by accident. So I, uh, uh, from a very early age, uh, had wanted to be a lawyer. And so I went to university, I actually studied law as an undergrad in preparation for going to law school. And unfortunately, by the time I got to the end of my undergraduate degree, I was just not prepared uh, to do another three plus years of schooling uh, to officially become a lawyer. So I had to make a decision. And one of the reasons why I had been interested in law as a profession was from a very early age, I'd always been interested in the big ideas, whether those were public policy ideas, political government ideas. And so I had a sort of originally intended to be a constitutional lawyer, uh, simply as a way to sort of strike that balance between, you know, really the, the fascination I had with law and legal systems, but also some of those broader governments and public policy considerations. And so when I finished my undergraduate degree, I had to get a job. And so I ended up working at Xerox Corporation of all places in the contract group. And it was really just a, a bit of a holding pattern for me. And I did want to get out of that sort of purely sort of corporate focused role into something that had a bit more of a, of a legal or an international dimension. And I ended up getting hired at a, at a, a, a medium sized firm that specialized in technology that enabled uh, supply chain and international trade compliance. And it was a perfect fit, like right from the very beginning, not only was it, you know, very interesting to me to be a part of a fast growing technology company, but also to be working with customers who were trying to solve some really wicked problems. And so whether that was trying to optimally source raw materials, whether it was trying to re-engineer their organization so that they could take more internal responsibility for compliance and supply chain. So rather than completely outsourcing everything to a third-party intermediary, whether it was a customs broker, a freight forwarder, or other type of partner, what we did was really empower organizations to take a lot more ownership of that. So it was a fascinating business, and I really got to work with some of the world's biggest and, and most sophisticated international corporations. And so that was uh, in the early 2000s, and I uh, joined Descartes in 2019. Um, and my current role as director of industry strategy is really, a, it's a fantastic job because I get to do so many different types of things. But the one common thread is working with customers, working with our partners, working with our internal teams to make sure that we're all aligned and focused in terms of, hey, what are the products that we need to be able to bring to market to help our customers meet some of the challenges that we're going to talk about today? How do we take advantage of new technological capabilities, whether that's, you know, really leveraging the cloud, big data, AI, machine learning, et cetera. So I get to do a little bit of everything. I get to be involved on the commercial side, on the customer side, on the research and development side. 
And then last but not least, having conversations with great folks like you and the audience here at Talking Logistics. So really, it's a, it's a great role. Love the company, love the customers, uh, and really excited to cover some of the topics we're going to discuss today. Well, that, that's great. Great background. I mean, I think one of the common threads, uh, you know, over all the years that we've been doing this uh, you know, show is that most of my guests have, quote unquote, fallen into supply chain logistics. You know, myself, I always tell folks, uh, you know, I'm an engineering background and then here I am, you know, 23 years now in, in supply chain and logistics. Um, and, and, you know, this is a topic, like I said in my opening comments, I mean, the, you know, when you think about supply chain, obviously supply chain is in the news so much more today than it was in the past. But, you know, I think most people, when they think now about supply chain, they, they generally think about, okay, products moving from point A to point B, they'll see trucks and ships and, you know, that, that visible aspect of it. But there's this whole other um, dimension to it that takes place in the background that people don't see, which is this kind of legal um, uh, compliance side of it that really, if that doesn't go according to plan, you know, everything else stops. If a product doesn't move across borders, uh, you know, you, you get detention and delays and, and so forth. So this is really one of those areas that, you know, the spotlight isn't always on it, but it's certainly very, you know, very important. Um, so I guess that, that leads me to the first question. I mean, you know, why is there growing demand for supply chain compliance and, and transparency? Maybe, maybe as a way to get started, even before that, it's maybe just quickly define maybe what that is. And then who, who is looking for this greater transparency? And why is it important? Sure. So in terms of defining some of the terminology that we we'll use just in really plain language terms, we talk about compliance, we talk about risk management, we talk about due diligence, really in the sort of most basic terms, which are, are you doing business with third parties? So whether that's suppliers, whether that's customers, whether that's supply chain intermediaries, who you can do business with, and what's starting to become even more part of the equation is who you should do business with. So really think about it as, you know, dotting the I's and crossing the T's from a regulatory perspective, from a risk management perspective, but also from an image and reputation protection perspective. And this is really what we're seeing a lot. And, and we'll talk about the, the Russia-Ukraine situation in a lot more detail, of course. But what we're seeing on the reputational side are a lot of the organizations who have what we term self-sanctioned by stopping their operations in Russia, removing uh, their you know, offices in Moscow or suspending operations altogether, not because it was illegal, but because either their customers or other parts of their stakeholder constituency were just not going to tolerate the risk uh, related to be seen to continue being doing business in a uh, somewhat sensitive geopolitical regions. So compliance really is the work of making sure that we're not running afoul of any regulatory uh, requirements, but more and more also making sure that we're not exposing our organization to multiple dimensions of risks, whether that's image and reputation, whether that's resiliency. We've heard a lot about resiliency in the supply chain over the past two years, and that's thinking about Hey, is this business a viable partner? Can they do the things that they have committed to doing for us? What's their relationship in their community? What's their relationship with their supply chain? So really in, in those broad terms, when we talk about compliance, we talk about managing risks, it's really about due diligence and doing the work necessary to have that visibility across all of the, the different types of third parties that we're working with. You know, you said something early on there that I, I think is, uh, you know, interesting. I hadn't thought about before, because I mean, a lot of times when you think about and when I think about compliant is, you know, um, thinking about, hey, you know, there are certain countries, certain entities and so forth that you are not allowed to do business with. Right. So you want to make sure that you're not running afoul of laws or regulations by doing business with entities or in countries that um, you know, you, you, there's some kind of a restricted party list or something like that. Um, but you said, you know, more and more, it's becoming about who you should be doing business with. And I think building upon your res resiliency point, one of the things that's come out of the both the the, the Russia Ukraine war as well as COVID nineteen is that companies are are starting to spread out in terms of looking for you know new sources of supply, new trading partners. 
so on and so forth. So that's part of that, you know, uh, exercise in terms of uh, becoming much more diversified, diversifying their supplier base, their trading partner base to minimize that risk, as you talked about, you know, part of it is to just to confirm that, hey, we want to do business with you. Let's just make sure that, you know, everything is in place or aligned so that we're legally and, 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 and capable of, of doing that. So I like that dimension of it is, is not only a, a one about, hey, let's make sure that we can't do business with, with uh, that we're not doing business with someone we shouldn't be doing. But you look at it from a more positive perspective is to say, hey, let's see how by leveraging this knowledge, this insight, these, these uh, technologies and so forth, let's, let's leverage this to be able to expand and diversify our supply chain, right? Yep. And a, and a really interesting dimension of this, particularly for me as I've been working with compliance professionals for the better part of 20 years, is for the longest time, they were seen as a necessary evil inside of a lot of organizations, right? So not typically very high profile, not typically very well resourced. You know, it was, it was always interesting to me to go from, you know, one very large multinational to another and see that they approached compliance in vastly different ways, whether that was who the compliance function reported to, how it was staffed, how much influence it had over the organization. And I think that what the pandemic really initiated was a bit of a rethink and perhaps a bit of a, of a mindset shift inside of organizations about the value that compliance teams can bring to an organization beyond just making sure that we're not paying too much duty or making sure that we're you know, not uh, contravening free trade agreement regulations, et cetera. Because these are folks who are very strong and from an analytical perspective, very strong from a paper trail, from a traceability perspective in terms of documenting how decisions get made, of stand, establishing standard operating procedures from a compliance perspective. And so in a lot of ways, organizations are realizing they have these hidden capabilities and, and folks who have made a career about wanting to do the right thing for their organizations. And so more and more we're seeing and organizations of all size and all types of industries really giving their compliance folks a lot more respect and bringing them to the table in a more strategic way because they're realizing that hey, this group of professionals can help us in ways that really maybe we hadn't thought of, but even more importantly, weren't that really clear to us five years ago even that some of these new types of risks, some of these new types of considerations were, were something that we would even have to take advantage or pay attention to. And just one quick anecdote on that, one of our customers, a very large multinational uh, electronics firm, I was speaking with one of our points of contact there and said, I've worked at this company for 15 years, never once had a conversation with uh, one of the senior team and since the end of February, when the Russia-Ukraine conflict broke out, I've been participating in daily briefings with the CEO, talking about how we are protecting our organization from the risks as it relates to this situation. So I think we're really at the, at the early stages of a, of a really a, a renaissance era for compliance professionals, because organizations are realizing that there's a lot of talent and a lot of capability in these teams that can be used to much bigger effect in their organizations. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great uh, anecdote. A great, and yeah, you know, I remember years ago, uh, um, God, this is going back at least fifteen years, uh, maybe longer. You know, I was doing a think tank with um, uh, uh, a variety of supply chain logistics professionals, and there was I remember a, a, a VP of compliance uh, at a very large pharmaceutical company, and she basically said, you know, no company, particularly a company of my size, would ever think of hiring anyone off the street for to do a finance job or, or something like that. But, you know, they view what I do as paperwork. And, uh, you know, as someone they could just hire, you know, they don't understand the, the level of risk that's involved, the complexity that's involved, um, and the value that we can bring to the organization. We do bring it to the organization. But, you know, to upper levels of management, we're just paperwork. Um, yep. And something that, you know, when, so when it comes to like technology, which we'll talk about in just a bit here, um, you know, it was something that many companies were 
working with spreadsheets uh, as is typical with a lot of supply chain processes, kind of managing the risk and reputation and compliance of these multi-billion dollar companies with, uh, you know, with, with just uh, spreadsheets and, uh, um, you know, maybe a, a handful of uh, trade lawyers that, that they've hired off, uh, you know, external partners to, to help them out. But from an internal resource perspective, they were very, um, you know, understaffed and, and underprepared. Certainly today, it's not surprising, you know, that, that story, because it seems like navigating kind of export controls, insurance compliance is, is it's more complex than, than ever. I mean, can, can you give some examples of, of why that is? Sure. And so, you know, obviously the Russia-Ukraine situation has brought into very sharp relief for people of all stripes and all types of industries, just how quickly the world changes now. And if we hadn't learned that lesson from the pandemic, uh, you know, it's, it's pretty hard to ignore now. But from, from our perspective, this type of volatility, and, it, and if you talk to somebody who's worked in compliance or in any type of regulatory role, as it relates to the movement of goods and services and capital around the world, like it's always been complicated. What's changed, particularly say over the past four or five years is the rate of change and the scope of change. And so what, you know, in very, in very simplistic terms, what used to be a linear exercise of, you know, cross-referencing products with company or with countries and is there a trade agreement that we can leverage? And what is the entry process, the, the filing process going to look like with the customs authority? As regulations have evolved, as requirements have evolved, it's not as linear as it used to be. And so a great example of that is a, um, you know, and I'm going to talk just about a, a US centric uh, piece of uh, legislation here, but something that's um, called the OFAC 50% rule. And so OFAC stands for the Office of Foreign Asset Controls. It's part of the uh, Commerce Department um, in the, or sorry, the Treasury Department um, in the United States government. And essentially what it says, this 50% this rule is, you can't do business with a company that has a majority ownership position by an individual who may be sanctioned, debarred, or restricted. And so think about, you referenced previously the a denied party list as an example. So when I started in the compliance business in the early 2000s, really was at the beginning of this notion of list-based compliance. So different jurisdictions or different regulatory bodies that were a part of these jurisdictions would publish lists of bad actors, whether those were individuals, whether those were companies, whether those were geographies, and really the, the work of compliance was, as I said, cross-referencing, making sure, okay, we're not gonna do business with this individual, this company, uh, or this country, or if we're doing business with those individuals and a license is required, we're gonna make sure that we have a license. So it was, it, it was never easy, but it was at least linear. And now with these sanctioned ownership restrictions, there isn't an exhaustive list that tells you as an example, the companies in Russia who are majority or partly owned by sanctioned individual uh, Russian people. So, you know, what's happened as a result of the conflict with Ukraine is the majority of the elected officials in Russia, anyone in, in Vladimir Putin's inner circle, all of these individuals are now essentially debarred from doing any type of business with the United States. But not only them individually, but if they have ownership stakes in companies, you can't do business with those companies because by extension, you're supporting a sanctioned individual. So now organizations are having to go beyond that linear approach and start getting into much more abstract, much more complex due diligence exercise to be able to disentangle the ownership structures of all of these international organizations and you know, is it maybe it's not the individual whose name that is in the ownership structure, but it's a holding company or some other type of, of financial instrumentation that they've built to run their affairs. And so the, the burden on companies to, to do this due diligence is huge. And the government is essentially beginning this. And it's, it's been happening, um, you know, particularly over the past few years, but the 
Um, OFAC 50% is a great example. We'll also probably touch on military end use or military end users. And those regulatory programs, there are not exhaustive lists that the government publishes. And partly it's because they don't necessarily have the resources to do it, but it's also a part of this broader trend of regulatory bodies delegating and downloading accountability for compliance onto enterprise. And so more and more, you know, we talked about the capabilities that compliance teams have, the experience that they have, they're well positioned to do this, but they're, they need help. And so whether that's working with an organization like us to, to automate or streamline some of the more operational components of compliance, but even more importantly, being able to get access to the right type of information to enable that due diligence. So we work really hard to make sure that not only are that we're bringing the right types of technology to our customers in terms of being able to help them automate and streamline some of those operational requirements, but also that we're providing them with this, this very sophisticated, very specialized content that helps them understand what the implications of these uh, risks might be, and ultimately help them make the best possible compliance decisions for their business. You know, that, that's, that's a great example there that you gave uh, in terms of just the, the, the fact that we, we've, we've uh, you, know, you can't capture all of these requirements in a simple list anymore, and how this has kind of, uh, you know, become much more, you know, complex. You know, and my next question is going to be about technology, but I think you just hit the nail on the head there at, at the end of your comments there, because there's there's technology to help you know automate streamline um, uh, things right from a software standpoint, but another big important part of the solution is obviously the content or the information or the market intelligence, you know. So it's the combination of the two that um, uh, you know are really what uh, you know you can't have one without the other, right? So I mean, yeah. so how how's technology and content uh, helping in this area, and then ultimately you know as companies are are now faced with these more complex requirements. I mean, what kind of capabilities should they look for in, when they're evaluating solutions? Sure. I mean, you know, for, just from a, from a philosophical, from a strategic perspective, our focus as an organization is on those two core dimensions, the right technology combined with the right data that really supports our customers to make those, those optimal business decisions that I referenced. And so in terms of, you know, I'll, I'll talk about each of them, you know, in isolation just a bit, and then we'll talk about the power of, of bringing them together. So from, a, from, a, from an automation perspective, if we think about something like restricted or denied party screening, there are still a lot of organizations who are doing that manually. And I'm not talking about, you know, small startups. I'm talking about large multinationals, companies whose names you would know who will reach out to us and say, yeah, we're still screening manually. We're going to all the different government sites. And, you know, we, you, you talked about Excel earlier. We've got a spreadsheet where we keep track of all the names that we've screened and whether or not we got a hit on those names. And what they may not realize is there are very mature, very well utilized solutions that make that, you know, just the, one of the easiest things that you're, going to do on any given day. So whether that's an online search engine that aggregates the content from all of those different sites that has configurability to ensure that you're not generating a lot of false positives that you can deploy in different ways across your organization. So that's, that's one. But even more importantly, and even more powerfully, there's also ways to automate screening inside of business systems. So whether that's your ERP system, whether that's a CRM system like Salesforce, as an example, instead of there needing to be a human intervention to execute that screening operation, it can all happen as a part of the system's workflow. So this is really powerful stuff. It's not sophisticated, like just speaking uh, to the, the integration piece, like this is web service APIs. This technology has been around for a while. What where we think the sophistication or the advanced uh, capabilities come in is the search itself. So how do you leverage a configurable, sophisticated search engine that can be tuned very finely to make sure that you're not going to be overwhelmed with false positives? So the technology exists. As I said, we have 
over 2000 customers working with us on this, just on this denied party screening uh, piece alone. So that's one. Content is something that's also expanding and changing at a, at a very rapid pace. And so you talk about those published government lists, but we also have things like license determination rules, like does a product require a license if it's going to a particular jurisdiction? We talk about these, what I would say, custom built lists based on work done by very um, large global research firms that have people in pretty much every city around the world gathering intelligence in real time, building a massive database. Like you want to talk about that big data, some of the information that's available from a market, a country, a, a, a business perspective, it's just vast. And so the, the merging of those two things, and this is where things like artificial intelligence and machine learning have such huge potential is essentially there's going to be no limits on the type of information that a company might want to aggregate and then leverage to make the best possible decisions for their business. So, you know, I talked about that, the spectrum of risk that starts at one end from the things you can't do and moves towards things that you shouldn't do as, you know, technology becomes more sophisticated and as organizations become more uh, aware of how this massive amount of information can be leveraged, the, the, the sky is really the limit. And I think that's why we really are entering a, a new paradigm with respect to compliance and risk management, simply because the amount of information we'll be able to review is for all intents and purposes limit, uh, limitless. It's now just going to be a matter of making sure that the right technology infrastructure is in place, that it can be sliced and diced and analyzed in, a, in an effective and a strategic way. You know, this is one of those areas, I mean, we talk about big data in supply chain logistics and, you know, as, as you just commented there, I mean, there is, um, you know, this is a great example of that. And of course, we're not talking about just the United States or just Canada. You talk, this is a worldwide, um, you know, uh, uh, scenario because, you know, every country has their own sets of requirements and regulations and they and lists and data and so forth. So it's really, you know, and obviously the biggest companies operate on a global uh, on a global basis as well, right? So it's not just about compliance and transparency, you know, within a single country. It's really within all the countries that they operate in and do business with. So it's it truly is a, a global big data analytics, you know, and, and, and automation, uh, you know, challenge here. Um, yeah. So, so as a way to as a way to wrap up, uh, Jackson, I mean, are there things that companies should you know keep an eye on with regards to supply chain transparency and compliance? I mean, anything they should start you know preparing for if they haven't already? Well, I, there's there's a couple that that uh, I think bear mentioning, Adrian, and and the 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 first is you know we've talked about some of the regulatory requirements and some of the challenges that the Russia Ukraine situation that the that the, the trade friction between the United States and China um, a couple of years ago have created. But what we're now starting to, to really shift into a lot more awareness, a lot more discussion around are things related to ESG. So environmental, social and, and governance compliance. And some of the, the audience today may have heard that the Securities and Exchange Commission really is starting to signal uh, pretty strongly that this ESG is not only is it not going away, it's likely to move from something that eh, we probably like to do as an organization to something that we're going to have to do. And if we talk about it just in, in really basic terms, ESG is about transparency. It's about, hey, how is our company contributing to you know, efforts to combat climate change? How is our company contributing to the improvement of social conditions, whether that's a you know, we got to make sure we're doing everything we can to not support slave labor or even, you know, suboptimal labor conditions, the companies that we work with across our supply chain or even our broader value chain. And then governance, how are we making sure that we are being transparent about how we make decisions about how we work with our stakeholders uh, across all kinds of different dimensions. And so that visibility, that transparency is something that I think organizations are starting to realize. And 
whether that's some of the signals that are coming from the SEC, uh, you may have heard that, or the audience may have heard, there's also some legislation in the early stages of, of passing in, in New York State that is going to require any type of, of organization above a certain size that's involved in the fashion industry to be very transparent and make mandatory disclosures about the nature of their third party relationships. So I think the, the big thing here is, and it's, it's, it's interesting because it takes me back in time to the beginning of my career in compliance where, look, our advice was always to be, be proactive, like don't wait for something like the Russia Ukraine situation, the, the China US trade war, the you know, you name the, the quote unquote black swan event that will finally compel you to take action. Don't wait for that. You need to be proactive and you need to start thinking about how to position your organization for success. And so I think if we talk about something like ESG, which is really now starting to move in that required direction, I think companies can, whether that's leveraging their compliance teams, whether it's talking to partners across the supply chain around, hey, how can we get out in front of this? And how can we demonstrate our commitment to the really the, the core elements of, of some of the ESG concepts, which is transparency, sustainability, uh, and really doing good by doing well, right? That's a term that, that you hear a lot of companies talk about. Yes, we want to be profitable. Yes, we want to return value to our shareholders. But we also want to be seen as a company that's doing its part for a, a sustainable future for everyone uh, on the planet. Yeah, and that's a great example. We actually wrote about uh, you know these developments at the SEC uh, not too long ago on, on talking logistics, and of course, you know similar regulations are either uh, in place already or are going to be in place uh, again in Europe and in other parts of the world. Mm -hmm. So again, it's another example of how this is really a uh, you know a, a global um, you know a global trend and something that companies need to be you know preparing for. Uh, today, well, ja Jackson, it sounds like you know, with these, with everything that's already going on today, plus these things going on that uh, are on the horizon, uh, you're going to be pretty busy <laughs> in the uh, in the years ahead. So uh, that, I'm sure that we'll have plenty of opportunities to uh, you know talk again in the future to see how all this continues to evolve and, and develop, uh, you know, out there. But uh, you provide some great food for thought and some great information uh, today. So again, thank you very much for making the time to be with us today. You're very welcome, Adrian. It was my pleasure. And uh, I look forward to speaking with you uh, again soon. Great. I want to thank those of you that joined us. Uh, if you're watching this episode on demand, either at the Descartes website or on Talking Logistics, and you've got a question or a comment for Jackson, you can post it there. And I'm sure he'll be more than happy to respond via that medium. So again, thank you for joining us. and look forward to seeing you in a future episode of Talking Logistics. Have a great day.